That's it. I'm gonna make you my bitch. One of the most eerie and mysterious events in my life happened not too long ago, actually just two years ago when I went to my native village for summer vacation. Since I was little, I had believed that there were invisible forces all around us that sometimes, in some unfathomable way, manifested themselves in our world, and that not all of them could evoke pleasant feelings in us. What I saw one summer evening on a deserted road near the village gave me the right to replace the word, I believe, with the more emphatic, I know. Needless to say, it gave me several sleepless nights and a panic-stricken, irrevocable fear of the native forests. Summer in Yakut village is a special time. While in the city summer is considered a time of rest and fun, in the village's work is in full swing. Haymaking is what occupies the hearts and minds of the residents, forcing them to rise with the first rays of the sun and spend time until late evening on the fertile glades, they are called alas in Yakutia. The northern summer is short-lived, one must have time to cut enough hay for the cattle to make haystacks and bring it to the farmstead. And, soon enough, the autumn is breathing down your neck. At the same time, haymaking is a time of relaxation. If you were born and grew up in the village it is your sacred duty to spend at least a couple of weeks every summer in alas, breathing in juicy aroma of freshly cut grass, listening to birds chirping and splashing with pleasure in crystal clear lakes. So, after finishing a tedious semester at the university, I got on the bus and drove home without a second thought. For the first week we mowed hay on a river islet, enduring the attacks of mosquitoes and gnats that swarmed in the humid air. After the first week, our skin was in such a condition that it no longer swelled up or itched after the bites. When we finished our work on the island, we moved to one of the Alice's, about 10 kilometers from the village. We went there in my stepfather's old UAZ, loading all the necessary equipment, scythes, rakes, pitchforks, into the trailer. Making hay in Alas is incomparably easier than on the island and not only because of relatively small number of insects. The main thing is that there are fewer irregularities of the land, stones and roots in Alice's, which can cause the scythe to break. For a skilled person the work here can seem a sinecure. I can't say that about me, but I confess that I also breathed a sigh of relief when we left the island. Usually, we finished by about 8 o'clock in the evening and returned to the village in the same car. But I soon got into the habit of taking my bicycle, which had been in my possession since my school days, on the cart and rolling home alone, enjoying the evening chill, the ride, and the sense of accomplishment. Especially since it was no more than half an hour away anything is better than jostling around in the stuffy UAZ in the company of my not so talkative stepfather. That evening was no exception. We had put in a few dozen haystacks, which later had to be gathered into one big stack. As the sun began to lean visibly toward the west, my stepdad packed up his gear and left. I think it was half past nine. I stayed in the alas and had a good swim in the little lake that was in the center of the clearing. The mood was excellent, with only the muddy, foot-polluting bottom of the lake marring the experience. It was more pleasant to swim in the river, the current creates a peculiar feeling, and the bottom is clean yellow sand. After leaving the lake, I got dressed and got on my bike. The sun, meanwhile, had taken on a purple-red hue, which in summer usually heralds rains. I pedaled leisurely, the wheel gently scattering the pebbles that lay on the dirt road. There were mostly conifers on both sides of the road, but occasionally I saw birches and larches. The abundance of various tree species obscured the road. Combined with the bright red ball of sun that flashed incessantly between the trunks, the sight was stunningly beautiful and contrasting. The fateful encounter took place with about 4 kilometers into the ride. At this point the forest parted on the right side, revealing another alas with a wooden perimeter fence the way the owners protect the hay from cows, horses, and other predators roaming freely near the villages. There was not a soul in the alas now, but on the far side I could see yellow haystacks. There was a thin river running to the left, so there weren't many trees there, either. Ahead was a sharp curve that made it impossible to see who was coming toward me, one of those high crash spots traffic cops talk about. 
Yakutia's dirt roads and highways are full of so-called bad places, where fantastic things supposedly happen, a grey-haired old woman with a staff chases cars, or a young girl waves down cars, who then suddenly disappears from the car without leaving any trace of her presence. Each such story is usually substantiated by some chilling story from the past that happened near that very spot. The old woman here was hit by a truck, and the girl hanged herself on a limb near the road, about 20 meters from where she stopped the cars, etc. But the road I was driving on had never had a bad reputation. If anyone had ever noticed any unusual phenomena here, the whole village would whisper about it for the next hundred years. So, I guess you could say I was lucky in a way. After admiring the view of the empty alas, illuminated by the red rays of sunset, I turned my gaze to the road and saw a rider on a horse coming out of the turn. The horse was saddleback and was moving forward at a light trot. The rider didn't surprise me in any way, live transport is popular in Yakutia and in many ways more convenient than cars. I confidently steered my bicycle toward the rider. Now, thinking back, I find only one sign that could have alarmed me then, namely, the horse's hooves did not make a characteristic clattering sound when they touched the ground. The horse ran quite silently, but I did not pay attention to this at the time. The animal seemed tired to me, as it ran with a droopy head. The man who towered on the saddle sat upright, not looking around. From a distance I could make out that he was dressed in dark clothes, but then again, I knew that too bright of a coloring in the tones of clothing was not welcome here. For that matter, I myself was in a grey tank top and brown shorts. And so I rode up close enough to sense that there was something wrong with the lone rider, but not yet at the level of intuition, because my brain had not yet fully analyzed the sensory readings. After a couple of moments, I suddenly realized with terrible clarity the first thing, which should not have been there if the rider was an ordinary man, his legs were monstrously long, so long that, despite the considerable height of the horse, they dragged on the ground. The legs did not end in a foot, but simply became thinner and thinner. And thinner. Until they just disappeared. Those were legs. The second observation that stirred the hairs on the back of my neck was about the horse. Earlier I had seen it from the front and therefore had not noticed anything unusual. As I rode closer, I could see the animal from the side, and another disgusting disproportionality came to my attention, the horse was long. As long as its owner's legs. The horse still had four legs, as I remembered, as usual, but his back stretched for meters. I think he would have beaten the length of three normal horses placed one in front of the other. These circumstances alone would have been enough to make me faint with fear, but I had the misfortune not to be content with that, and to look up into the face of the dreaded rider. As soon as I did so, I no longer remember what it was like, I vaguely remember the painful fall and the stinking, burnt rubber-like smell that filled my nose. It must have just gone by without paying attention to me. Anyway, I woke up to find myself lying on the road with my bike, my right shin burning with fire, nothing major, as it turned out, it was just skin peeling, and the road empty again. The bad smell, too, had dissolved, disappeared into the air. The sun shifted a little in the sky, the swoon didn't last long. Its blood red light almost made me vomit. With an army of goose bumps running down my back, I somehow got up and saddled my bike. Riding leisurely was out of the question, I drove as fast as I could glancing back and forth to make sure the long-legged rider wasn't following me. After 15 minutes, which seemed to me like an hour, I entered the village and breathed a sigh of relief. I could hear music playing from stereo speakers in the yards, a chainsaw screeching somewhere, and the hubbub of children. All this calmed me down substantially. I couldn't keep quiet about the incident and told my parents. We agreed that this creature was a so-called passing ghost, who was on his way to other places on his own business. Local campfire folklore gives many examples of such encounters. Such a ghost could not harm me, even theoretically, but it did not help me to regain my peace of mind. I did not, understandably, ride my bike past that alas at the evening again. Even going out to the outdoor restroom at night became a bit of a problem for me. Over time, however, the vivid colors of that encounter began to blur a bit, and I hope that I can suppress that fear somehow. But one trait of the fearsome horseman I will never forget. I didn't tell my parents or friends about it, confining myself to the long legs and the deformed horse. It was just too frightening to conjure up again the image of what had sent me fainting and seemed capable of it even now, at night, when I was alone at home, the goggling, paper-cut eyes of the man on the horse that took up most of his face. Yakuts are afraid of dead people. Well, everyone is afraid of them. But according to Yakut beliefs if a dead person in any form, in a dream or in an encounter, 
appears to living people, especially relatives, then you can be sure that his spirit pulls the soul of a living person to the other world. There are exceptions, of course, for example, if in a dream the recently deceased relative passes on some request like, tell my daughter that 9000 rubles are hidden under her pillow, but usually seeing the dead is not good. This story has something to do with that. There lived in a village an old retired man. His house was big and he had no one. So he decided to rent a room to a trainee who was interning at the local hospital. The relationship between the landlord and the girl was smooth, nobody interfered with anyone, sometimes in the evenings they chatted about this and that. One winter evening, Tanya was returning from the hospital. As she entered the yard, she heard the crunch of snow somewhere on the opposite side of the yard. The darkness made it impossible to see who it was, but she thought it was the old man doing some business. But what surprised her was that the man was panting and moaning very hard as if suffocating. The girl asked loudly, who is that? And immediately the footsteps and strange breathing subsided. After standing for a while, the girl felt uncomfortable and went into the house. The old man was sitting by the stove, and she realized that there was no way it could have been him. As she quietly stirred, she decided not to say anything, so as not to frighten the old man. They sat down to dinner, and she noticed that the old man looked kind of sad. When she asked him, he said, I went to take a nap after dinner and dreamt about my younger brother, who had been dead for 20 years. He kept calling me to go with him, but I refused. It's bad luck. The girl felt even more spooked, but she kept silent. Night fell, and they went to their rooms. The girl could not sleep and kept tossing and turning in her bed. The old man was asleep in the next room, and she could hear his ragged breathing. Suddenly the snow crunched again outside, right under the girl's window, and she heard the same intermittent, moaning breathing as if someone had just run a fucking marathon and was out of breath. The girl covered her head with the blanket, almost dying of fright. A minute passed, and, crunching snow, an unseen guest moved to the window in the old man's room. Immediately, she heard the old man's sleepy breathing change, and he, too, began panting and wheezing, tossing and turning in his bed. She thought she should wake him up, but the guest outside the window also breathed almost in unison with the old man, and she was afraid to get out from under the covers. She did not know how long it lasted, and eventually fell asleep. The first thing she did in the morning, when dawn broke the night, was go out to the bathroom and examine the snow, no sign of footsteps. With a sigh of relief, she went in for breakfast. The old man was even more gloomy than yesterday, he told her that he had dreamed about his brother again, this time angry and determined to take him down by force. I fought as hard as I could, but he still knocked me down and dragged me away by force, the old man sighed. Here at last the girl dared to tell what she had heard. When the grandfather heard it, he fell into a state of depression, you'd better wake me up before he overpowers me. It was definitely him, I remember him wheezing awfully when he was dying of tuberculosis. Now I'm a dead man. And indeed, not a week later, the old man came down with pneumonia and never recovered. He was buried next to his brother. And she had to move in with another family. There is a belief, Diakakehe, the coffin night. This is how villages call the evening of the day when someone died or someone is buried. It is believed that on such days spirits come from the other side to accompany the soul of the deceased to the other world, so the border between the visible and invisible is thinner. Those who are not invited may come out, that is why it is taboo to make lots of noise in the street, have fun and in other ways to attract attention. Otherwise, very undesirable fellows might gather to make noise. For large settlements and cities, where every day someone croaks, this notion naturally loses its meaning, but in the villages even today this belief is very widespread. In one village, an old man died who had a hundred relatives. Naturally, the grieving relatives all came to the village to prepare a decent funeral. The small children also came and, of course, quickly managed to make friends with each other. It was summer, so in the evening the new friends organized outdoor games, they were children after all, why should they sit in stuffy houses and look at the sullen faces of people? Of course, there was a lot of shouting, laughter and hooting and hollering. Some of the older people shouted at them, Dahai Kehei, don't fucking frolic like that, but most of the kids were left to their own devices. When the tossing and turning got boring, the kids started playing hide and seek in the yard. There was a kid about 10 years old who led the way. The children disappeared into all sorts of nooks and crannies, and he started looking for them. He quickly found someone and then wandered into the winter house, which was empty for the summertime and used as a warehouse. Even though it was summer nights, it was gloomy inside. The guy peeked into the rooms, nada. 
Already on his way out, he noticed a large closet rack with closed doors. Walking with a poker face past the closet, he jerked it open, but inside were just winter clothes, jackets, coats, etc. He suspected that children might be behind them, so he started probing with his hands. Running his hand up the sleeve of a large coat, he suddenly felt something cold. He looked up and saw that there was a knife glittering behind the sleeve of a coat. He was surprised and started touching further. It turned out that the knife was held by someone's hand, cold as ice. The boy pushed back the coat and saw that behind him was hiding a man of no less than 2 meters, looking down at him. The half-light made it impossible to see his face, but the stinky smell hit him in the nose. He screamed in a bad voice, and the boy rushed out of the house and told the children everything. They went into the house in a huddle and checked the closet, nothing but clothes. They laughed at the boy, saying he was a coward. And continued to play. The next one was led by another boy. Everyone, as usual, hid, and the boy went to search. After some wandering, he entered the stable in the far corner of the manor. Since the windows in the barn were small, there wasn't much light either. But the boy could clearly see a man hiding in the corner in the shadows. That's it, I found you, the boy declared. Come out. The man held his hand to his mouth without moving, as if playfully suggesting silence, and began to chuckle softly, as if he were having a lot of fun. The boy approached him with the words, Come out, I said, and saw up close that it wasn't his fucking friend, but some bald, naked little man with disproportionately high, almost on his forehead, glistening round eyes, a chubby, lumpy belly, and a tongue hanging out of his mouth down to his neck. The kid shit himself, literally, that is, and was out on the street in a flash. When the kid ran to his parents in hysterics and told them everything, the adults forbade the kids from playing outside for the next few days. The fun was over. This is usually accompanied by the moral, every activity has its time, but since we are not moralists, we can deduce a lesson that you should not wander into dark alleys when there is a dead man lying in the next house. They say that in villages, alices and in the woods, you can often hear various sounds and voices from nowhere, the source of which is impossible to determine. It's not considered to be particularly creepy, you never know what you might hear. But there are also creepy cases. A certain Anon lived in a Yakut village in one summer, having bathed to excess, got pneumonia. He was sick for a long time and finally recovered. Of course, he was on sick leave, so he did not work and laid at home during the day when no one was around. It should be noted that their house was on the outskirts of the village near the edge of the forest, and so, on a clear sunny day, feeling fit, the man decided to take a walk outside. Breathing fresh air, he heard strange sharp sounds. At first, he could not understand where they were coming from, but since he did not see anything noisy nearby, he decided that the sounds were coming from the forest. He went to the edge, and indeed, the sounds became louder and clearer. Curious, Anand went further to see what was going on there. He thought maybe there was some construction going on in the woods. The sound was very close, but still nothing was visible, so the man went deeper into the woods. He finally determined what it sounded like, the sound was exactly as if wooden planks were being thrown at each other, quite common to hear during the construction of a wooden house. But it was somehow too rhythmic and constantly seemed to drift away, no matter how far one walked. He had already gone quite deep into the woods, and the sound was still some distance ahead. Anon began shitting bricks, realizing that there was something fishy going on there, especially since gradually the source of the sound had moved somewhere down, as if it was coming from a glade or from under the ground altogether. But there was no glade in this area. Nevertheless, the man walked forward, hoping that it was just his hearing playing a trick on him. And he walked until he came across an old, abandoned cemetery from the pre-Soviet times. The location of the sound of the boards was clearly defined, from under the ground beneath the ancient graves. The man got goosebumps and rushed away. That night he told everything to his relatives and fell into angst, for it is widely known in Yakutia that the noise of wooden planks, whether in dreams or in hallucinations, is not good for the one who hears them. Associations with the creation of a coffin, that is, the patient will soon die. And so, it turned out, the next morning the pneumonia worsened again, and a couple of days later the man left this world. My father once told me a story that happened to him personally. The story has to do with the spirit of the hunt, by Anai. My father and his friends decided to go out hunting in the deep woods. As they drove the UAZ to their deployment point, a couple of young guys started drinking vodka. Passing by the lake, 
one of them started to badmouth the lake in every possible way. Like, what a puddle, no fish obviously. He was quickly shut up. Soon they drove quite deep into the woods, and getting out of the car, the second of the drunkards started picking on the place where they were going to hunt. He, too, was quickly shut up. Holding a ridiculous grudge mixed with the alcohol they had drunk, the two friends decided to hunt separately from the others. The first went into the woods to supposedly get the biggest game, while the second, remembering the lake, went fishing. My dad and the others didn't find any game. Everyone was very disappointed. A fair amount of time passed. Soon a shot from a rifle came from the woods. The hunters rejoiced, thinking that at least the young ones were smiling with hunting luck. After a while there came one more shot from the lake. They started joking, they said, grief is a fisherman. Hunters were sitting, waiting for the young ones, but they still were not coming. Evening came. Have decided, that young men have lost the way, the guys had drunk a substantial amount of vodka after all. Soon the local news reported two suicides. Both had their heads blown off. That's why the people say, mayn't imbibe it. Yes, Bayana was offended. I have an interest in modern urban legends. In general, living in Yakutsk, I had heard several quite interesting stories that had a public resonance and were discussed in the media. It was in the 90s, and a rumor was circulating in the city, that at night in the city, in the darkness of the night, there wanders a certain man. Either a madman or a wild man or a werewolf. There were theories that it was a man suffering from lycanthropy. A rare psychological disorder. The story goes like this, at night, on rare occasions, passers-bys were attacked by a man running on all fours and biting, some trying to drag them under the house. In Yakutsk, houses are built on stilts, because the foundations collapse because of the permafrost, and under the house you can safely walk, piss, fuck, hide from sight, rape, hide dead bodies, litter, etc. Later that lycanthrope disappeared and since the early 2000s nobody remembered these stories. But recently there have been stories on the net that something big and hairy, wolf-like, wanders around the Republican Medical Center at night. I, for example, think that the story from the 90s and the story about the strange beast-like man near the medical center are interconnected. For example, the story from the Yakutsk Psychological Forum. I get creepy when I remember, on January 25th this year between 5 and 6 in the morning near the medical center I saw something creepy, it was a man who looked like a wolf, of course everyone will consider it a fiction or some kind of disorder, but that's what I really saw. I saw how this creature was huge compared to the man, I first thought it was a tall man in a black trench jacket, but when approached I clearly understood that it was not a man, it easily jumped over the distance of about 5 meters, I distinctly know that a person in a Yakut winter at this time cannot jump so far. I was overcome with panic, and the smell was so scary, I even did not have time to do anything, I only remember how I was in the apartment and stood in the kitchen with a gun. I didn't want to tell my wife at first, I was afraid she would think something was wrong with me, but then I calmed down and decided to tell her what was happening. My wife was frightened and for good reason, she firmly and resolutely asked me if I was on drugs. I wanted to go to the police station, but what can I tell them? That I saw a wolf with two legs or a man who looks like a wolf. Everyone knows that there are no werewolves, I do not believe it either. But I am scared of what happened. It was creepy, that is the only thing I know for sure. I wanted to write in the X-File forum, but they are all made up stories. Hopefully someone will help shine a light as to what happened, lately I feel a strange weakness, dizziness and an unconscious sense of fear. Basically, everyone started laughing and suggesting to go to a therapist, but I found a few more witnesses. How true their words are, I do not know, but internet folklore on that and the internet folklore, some believe, some do not. My two sons also saw the creature jump over our fence. That was about three years ago. They saw it clearly up close, too. I believe them. By the way we also live near the med center. I would tell a lot of interesting things about it, but I do not have time now. I'll come back later. I would even agree to take a lie detector. And to the author, you can relax, what you saw it is not a figment of a sick imagination. Next. At the same time, dogs began to disappear in our area. For example, our sheepdog, a huge male dog, who stood on a chain also was taken away. Our neighbors had a Caucasian. They tried to snatch him, too, but he did not let them. We also found several dead dogs. Two corpses in terrible condition were found near us in a pile of crates, a dog's head on the road and a few other such cases. I contacted the police station and the disappearances start to slow down. But in the nature of its work, 
I usually woke up at 5 a.m. at 5.30, like fucking clockwork, began a cacophony of howling dogs. And the howling always started on one side and ended in the area of empty houses. Our new dog was smarter. She, as soon as the howling began, immediately hid in the doghouse and lay there shivering until 6 a.m. A year ago, everything just stopped at once, and now it is quiet and peaceful. I have never talked about it, because I was afraid, and who would believe it, but since there is such a topic I thought might as well. It was 1995, I was still in the 10th grade at school, and one night, secretly without my parents' knowledge, I went out on the balcony to try smoking a regular opal. I looked down, it was the beginning of the white nights, everything was clearly visible. I see a dog running, a large mongrel, grey color, but right under my balcony, it suddenly stopped, looked around, and jumped up on his hind legs and ran away. That took my breath, a sense of daze and fear came over me, I stood motionless for maybe 5 or 10 minutes, could not move, then I came to my senses a little and quietly went inside. In my head for some reason I thought that if I told someone about this, it would come for me, so I have told no one, and no one would believe it anyways. This occurred at about 2 in the morning. I remembered a bedtime story. I lived in a remote Yakut village that had its own old school, it was something like 100 years old, wooden, with outdoor facilities. The wood was blackened from dampness and old age, the roof was covered with mold, the floor looked flat and the walls were straight. People were killed during the revolution, people lived and starved there during World War II, unsurprisingly there were rumors about that school. In any case, the atmosphere in the building was always gloomy, little light, the windows big and dusty, and the quarters cramped. Often even the adults acted as if there was an evil spirit there, at night someone's footsteps or as if someone was running around. Anyway, when I was a student, there were a lot of stories like, the hung pioneer, flying hats, the man with chains, and the headless man. But this story happened to me and I can say with 100% certainty that I was not under the influence of substances or alcohol. When the story took place, I was around 13 years old or so. At that age I was still immature and innocent, so at 13 I was just a kid with childish and pure thoughts. My uncle worked at the school, a feminine faggoty man, but who had a wife and kids. But his queerness doesn't play a role in the story, just remembering everything down to the smallest detail. My uncle worked as a security guard and often his youngest son, a trained and stupid monkey, would come on shift with his father to spend the night. He must have been 11 years old. On one of my uncle's shifts, I went with them to that school. Just before the shift he and his son stopped by to get something to eat. It must have been the early 2000s and there wasn't much to eat in the remote Yakut villages. In all, the school was big with two floors. It was already about 8 pm by the time we had arrived and the winders in Yakutia are black, dark, and all consumingly scary. My uncle went off somewhere, I think, to have a chat with some women who scrubbed the floors. We stayed in the room at the farthest end of the school and played, I don't remember what. But we had as much fun as we could. But then we got wary, it was very, very quiet in a special way. As if no one was in the building. All you could hear was the slight buzzing of a fluorescent lamp. And in that silence, somewhere in the distance you could hear the sound of an empty bucket rolling across the tiled floor. Well, at 9pm there could still be cleaning ladies, so we did not get too scared and continued to play. At one point we had to go to the bathroom. Even though we had to go outside to pee, there was one working toilet in the building, which worked intermittently and was locked. It smelled like shit and other disgusting things all the time, so it was rarely used. I took the key, found an old gas mask in a pile of junk, put it on and opened the door to the corridor. It was very dark in the corridor, I began to go out and suddenly in the farthest corner I saw a man. He was standing with his back to me, when the door opened, the bright light cut off a piece of darkness and faintly illuminated the opposite wall. I got a better look at the man, he was wearing a black robe, his hands behind his back, his head tilted forward. At first, I wasn't frightened, he looked like an ordinary man. It was strange that he was standing in complete darkness though, I thought. He then turned around, I distinctly remember that it was a young Yakut guy. His face was ordinary, without anger and expressed nothing at all. He looked at me blankly. He didn't move, he just stood there and watched. I shat bloody bricks for some reason and ran back into the safety of the security room. My cousin and I hid behind the table and lay there, not moving, until my uncle came. We told him about what happened and he said that maybe we imagined it or the janitor was coming in through the window, drunk. We went to check the janitor room, the office was closed, we went inside, the windows were closed. 
nobody could get out through the window and close it from outside. Anyway, my uncle brushed everything off, and I stayed up the whole night. It was creepy. Besides, my cousin was following me and didn't see that man, since I was the first one out and he was directly behind me in the room. At that time, there was no one in the school except me, my uncle, and the two cleaning ladies. I don't know what kind of Yakut Kun was standing there. Back in the days before the Soviet Union, the Yakuts lived in the laces, lost in the impenetrable taiga. Usually, families and close relatives settled in the middle of the field. They built two tents, one for winter, and a yurt a little further away for summer. Such many villages were called Agayusa, if to translate roughly, it means, paternal kinship, or something in that spirit. Sometime in the 1920s two Yakut families, distant relatives, lived in one alliance, lost among the impenetrable forests. It was the end of summer, and almost August. The adults went out every day to cut hay, leaving two adolescent boys at home to watch the calves and meet them for tea in the evening. Basically, the boys played in the abandoned barn all day, looking after the calves from time to time. The adults, before leaving, usually punished them not to go beyond the fence in the direction of the ancient graves. By the way, in Yakutil is almost everywhere you can come across Chian Yuosa, old, decayed graves in the form of small, cobblestone houses, which probably stand for several centuries on elevations. One fine morning, the parents went out to the hayfield again, and the boys were left to play in the abandoned barn. There were no toys in those days, and the children played with all sorts of plants, wood, stones and other gifts of nature. In the morning, when they came to their usual playground, the boys found that the bulbs of iris, which were the farm animals for their games, had wilted. The children decided to pluck fresh bulbs, but it turned out that everything near the barn had already been plucked, and not far beyond the fence the irises were growing vigorously and invitingly. Spitting on their parents' taboo, the boys went out to pick iris seeds and look around. After picking enough of the necessary ones, the children decided to go back but, one of the boys found lingonberries next to a bum. Forgetting their games, they began to pick unripe lingonberries and greedily ate them. Having tasted the berries, they wanted more and they decided to go a little farther in the direction of the graves, the sun was already starting to set. They were walking slowly, talking about this and that, and suddenly, in the middle of a sentence, one of the boys became abruptly silent, the other walked forward without noticing anything, and then heard a piercing scream. He looked around and saw his friend standing with his head up, shrieking in horror. The boy looked where his friend was looking and saw a long black man as tall as a decent sized tree, eyes the size of fists, the man took a step towards him, and the boys ran back home. The one who first saw him was stockier and stronger than his friend and therefore ran faster, the other shouting for him to wait up. He could hear the Abasi chasing just a few yards behind him. The first boy stumbled and fell, and the smaller one ran as fast as he could home and heard his friend calling and screaming as if he was being cut. When the boy ran home, he fainted and only woke up when his parents arrived, they didn't notice anything and scolded him for not boiling water. The next morning the boy went out again to play in his usual place, but his friend was not there. He went to his house, his parents were home and said his friend had been very sick since last night. By lunchtime that boy had passed away. Here's another legend from Yakutia. Not even really a legend, when I was 13 years old, it went around our village as a rumor that happened to people from our village, with specific names and locations. So, fuck knows. One family mowed one haystack over the summer in a glade alas near a village called Surduk. Yakut for Hilly. And one day the man and his brother went to that alas with a tractor to take the haystacks to their place. They loaded everything on the trailer, and in the evening they went home. It did not appear as if they broke any taboo or caused any problems connected with religion and customs, but as usual, the Abaza can scare people. It was rumored that at dusk they reached the hillside at the exit of the alas, and then the tractor stopped. It wasn't that it had broken down or stalled, it just wouldn't move on, stood still. The men scratched their heads, pressed the gas, the engine roared, no effect. The younger brother decided to get out to see what could be wrong, but not a couple of seconds later, he flew back into the tractor cabin, pale as death. When asked by the older brother, he babbled that there was something huge sitting on top of the haystack loaded on the trailer. The older man couldn't believe it and looked out himself, indeed, there was a man of huge size, looking like a black silhouette in the evening twilight. He had his back straight, his legs spread, his hands resting on the hay. 
A disgusting smell immediately crept into the cabin, a canonical sign of the presence of a bossy. Naturally, the older brother immediately realized that the guest in the hay was not fucking human, he did not dare to call him. They did not move. All in all, they sat like that for about half an hour. Both of them were scared shitless, from time to time they pressed the gas, but the tractor was standing, the stench in the cabin made their eyes water. The sun was setting, the autumn darkness was gradually gathering around and the black giant was still sitting on the trailer, fun. The men had already begun to think about getting out of the tractor and walking leisurely to Sertic on foot, one mustn't run, he would chase you, when suddenly the noise of the tractor engine changed. Younger guessed to try to move the juggernaut, and it quietly drove forward. Brothers looked back, nobody in the hay. They exhaled in relief and hurried home, where they told everyone everything. Also, those who had been in the Alas the next day said that the wheels of the trailer had sunk into the ground by about 15 centimeters, as if the creature sitting on it weighed dozens of tons. It was in the 1970s in the Tadiolis. It all started when our distant relative Seraphim came to our house in Yaikuyel. After drinking tea, he said he wanted to go home to Walba, but since there weren't many cars at the time, there were no private ones at all, he asked us for a bicycle. In those days almost everyone rode a bike, old and young, men and women, almost like in China. We had two bikes and his parents lent him the Ural. Walba is 33 kilometers north of Yaikuyel. There was no federal highway then, although the main route now remains the old one, but the entrance to Walba was different. He turned a little earlier, and the road went through two fields, the first is called, Yen, Herla. The road entered the field from the east side, went down, went under the hills, north side, and left from the west side with a rise past a small cemetery and through a woodland, then went down into another field. If anyone has read about Yakut Toponymy by Gorik, there is a picture of such a field. There is a grave on each mound, so to speak, each has its own mound. Seraphim drove into this field in the evening, just as the sun was setting. He passed under the hills, got up to leave the field and saw, on one of the graves with his back to him, a woman was sitting and combing her hair. Seraphim was surprised, thinking what kind of a crazy woman had found such a place to sit. Going uphill, he stopped and looked to see who she was. When he stopped and turned around, the sun was just shining on the woman. It was a young woman, her name was Christina, who had hanged herself not long ago and was buried here. Seraphim could not remember how he got home, which was about three kilometers away. He came home, completely sick at heart. Christina started showing up everywhere after that. I remember Walba was under siege that summer. People were afraid to go out in the evening. Constantly, a little tornado would come from the side of the field where she was buried and disappear by the house where she lived. After her death, one grandfather lived there. He, a poor man, was driven out every night by Christine, the grandfather could not stand it and moved out. That summer my grandmother and I came to Walba, and she would not let us go outside to play after dinner. I remember being told that Christina was met by her own best friend when she was out gathering cows. After that meeting, the friend was hospitalized for a long time. And most interestingly, she was seen by Russian chauffeurs bringing cargo to Walba, sitting on the grave and combing her hair. They said that they asked the locals, what kind of crazy person is sitting on your grave and combing her hair? I remember my grandmother grumbling that someone who had died a bad death was buried in the common cemetery, and as if she had been buried normally. That is, on her back, without an earthen pot on her head, or face down. They even nailed a star with flags on the grave post. Then winter came. In April of the next year Seraphim's father Durendi, an old communist, bought several kilos of salt and sprinkled it all over the grave so that the salt would be absorbed by the melted snow. No one has seen her since. So that's the story. And that bike came back and was with us until the 1980s. An unusual, mystical event took place on June 27, 2012, in the village of Sodensi in the East Aldenullis. During a thunderstorm, many whirlwinds swept through the area and locals saw the silhouettes of 20 riders with ancient weapons, both carrying them and stuck in them. The same thing happened the next day, but that time there were only three riders. Sasha Pavlov, a 8th grade student at school number 2 in Yakutsk, an eyewitness. My friend and I, as usual, were walking around the village. At first, I didn't notice that the sky was covered with thick dark clouds. A strong wind came up and began to chase the dust. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a whirlwind approaching, inside which were some dark figures. 
My friend and I looked closely and realized that these figures had the outlines of people on horses. There were about 20 of them. It was as if they were moving one by one. We watched it for a while until the tornado disappeared behind the Uigilala store. We ran and told everything to a friend's cousin. She got really scared, and we all ran home. At home my grandmother said it was an omen for something bad. I didn't know what to think myself. Ala Mesnikova, a resident of the village Sadensi, an eyewitness. I was standing near the store. The wind blew in and raised dust, everything around became brown. There were some boys nearby and they showed me the tornado, inside which I could make out two shadows. I was standing in front of the store, and the wind blew up dust, and everything around me turned brown. As I wrote earlier, shamans were being cucked and persecuted under the Soviet rule, so there were few of them. But that doesn't mean that they all degenerated or that they used to be all charlatans, they just went underground, hid their abilities, suppressed their powers, and so on. I'll throw in too many stories with shamans in Soviet times. The first case took place in Stalinist times. In a small village in the central district, I think Namsky, there was a man who secretly provided the local shaman services. People used to say that if he didn't hide on purpose, he could have become a great shaman in the old days. Eventually, when people from other districts started coming to this man, the KGB secret police decided to take the propagator of obscurantism by the gills. So, they came especially for his sake, broke into the house, made a mess, and arrested him. They took him to Yakutsk on horses. It was a long way, until it got dark. And when it got dark, one of the guards suddenly noticed that the shaman's horse was riding without a rider. He could not have gone anywhere, he had just been here, no one saw him running away, and his hands were handcuffed, but he was gone. They raised a hue and cry, drove back, came to the village at midnight, and he was sleeping peacefully, having had a hearty dinner. They tied him up again, both his hands and feet, loaded him onto a cart, and drove him out into the night. Somewhere in the middle of the road the guard once again looks into the cart. He, again was nowhere to be found. They got nervous, but what can you do? They had to go back, for the third time. The head of the escort talked to the shaman alone, pressed on the pity, he said that if he did not bring the shaman to town as was ordered, that then he himself would be put in jail. The shaman took pity and went with them without any handcuffs. They reached the city in the morning and immediately sent him to prison. But again there was a problem, as soon as the shaman entered the courtyard, with each step he began to swell. And by the time he thus reached the prison building, he had become so big and shapeless that he could not get in either the door or the window. With each step back, he shrank again. The prison guards were shocked and amazed. A big shot from the KGB saw this and told them to bring the shaman to him. It is unknown what they talked about, but after that he ordered him to be released in peace and even ordered that he be driven back to his home in the village at the expense of the treasury. The KGB never touched him again. After that he tried not to show off his skills too much, although he continued to help people in secret. The second case also happened about that time. This shaman lived in the Vili Yolis and was quite a well-off peasant. When collectivization reached the level of, if you don't go to the collective farm, you rot in prison, and it became clear that all his goods would be taken away from him anyway, he told everything to fuck off, transferred his farm to the collective farm, and went off to live in a woods, where he built himself a hut and hunted. He had a young relative who would periodically visit him, bring him booze and tell him the latest news. The shaman urged him to come in the morning or in the afternoon, he had, his own business, there in the evening. So, he did, but once he was too late, either he got lost or had business to attend to, and came to the cabin in the forest after sunset. It was summer, which is the time of white nights in Yakutia, so it was still quite bright. The guest went into the hut, and there was nobody there. He wondered where the man had gone to in the middle of the night. He went back out, listened, and there were voices in the woods behind the hut. That's when he felt uncomfortable. The woods, a lonely hiker, what the fuck kind of conversation is that? A little apprehensive, he went to look anyway. The voices came closer and closer, at least three or four different people, and one of them was clearly the shaman. Mainly he spoke, and others from time to time inserted something and nodded. The guest listened attentively. The dialogue was approximately as follows. And I didn't do harm to people, so why am I being punished? Tell me, is it fair? <laughs> they took away all my goods, and banished me to the woods like a useless old dog. Tell me, shall I bear such a wicked offense? <laughs> and what must I do to restore my good name and regain my respect? 
Is there a way? There is. The voices didn't answer in a clone chorus, of course, but in different ways, and not in such a monosyllabic way, but that's not the point. In general, the young man was really shitting himself and did not listen any further to what they were talking about. As he stepped back, he vaguely saw the shaman sitting on a stump among the trees, propping his jaw with his hands, and some long dark creatures crowding in front of him. He did not look at them and ran off. When he came back in the morning and told the shaman what he had heard in the evening, he flatly denied it. Fuck it, are you crazy? I'm the only one here, who can I talk to? You should drink less. That's the way it is. The story is incomplete because I don't know if this shaman actually got his stuff back afterwards. Something tells me he did. There is a small village in Yakutia called Iskati, Three Birches. Not far from the village, 15 kilometers away, in a clearing in the woods is an old house, where, according to rumors, the Abasi, that is, the devil, dwells. All people who live in the village avoid this house. As you know, during the days of the Soviet Union, people were taught that nothing supernatural exists. And for some reason known only to the officials themselves, the council of the district center decided to send an expedition to that house to prove that there are no otherworldly forces there. The expedition consisted of 10 people, almost all were party officials from the district center, among them were only a couple of locals, including the head of the village council, who did not want to go. He grew up in the village and knew about this house long ago, but had to go, after all, the head, if he refused, he would be removed from office. They went by truck, and took a case of vodka with them. They arrived at the place, unloaded, went into the house, which consisted of one big room, in the old days they built it that way. Inside, everything was relatively clean, there was a stove and a table. Our heroes first examined the house, all the holes and corners, they did not find anything suspicious. They dragged a crate of vodka into the house, started drinking and talking. Soon it was night time, people made their sleeping bags on the floor and fell asleep. And then one of the guests suddenly felt someone pulling down his blanket. He pulled it back to him, and then someone abruptly ripped the blanket out of his hands. The man quickly got out of bed, looked around, everyone was asleep. Stop it, it's an old family. He exclaimed, thinking it was one of the others fucking with him. Near the opposite wall another guy stood up. What is it? Don't make any noise. You are disturbing to sleep. And then the kettle, which was standing on the stove, flew at this guy's head all by itself. What's wrong? The guy exclaimed grabbed the kettle and threw it back towards the stove. Seconds later the kettle came flying again. Everyone woke up as a result of the commotion. They turned on their flashlights and calmed down, there seemed to be no one in the house but them. And then heavy footsteps were heard outside the front door and someone shouted, Get out! The front door opened, and everyone was horrified to see that behind the threshold stood a man, covering the whole of the door frame. Next thing they came to on the road outside the village. Everyone was walking one by one, barefoot and lightly dressed. It was almost morning. Nobody remembered anything, even though they had walked half a dozen kilometers, barefoot, their feet were bleeding. In this strange way they returned to the village, but their belongings and weapons were still in the house. The members of the expedition started asking the locals to go back there and get their things. No one agreed for a long time, but then they found three hunters who were promised money and a case of vodka for the feet. The hunters arrived at the glade in the afternoon, quickly went in, gathered their things in an armful without looking, and jumped back out. My uncle, who heard it from a direct participant in the story, told me this. He said his hands were shaking as he recalled that terrible night. Yakut, Abyss, are not some corporeal monsters like the Chupacabra, but a kind of projection from another world, and it is often pointless and even dangerous to punch them in the face from a U-turn, like in that story about the Suliukunes, where the Abasi fucked up a guy in an old house. Although there were some recommendations on how to deal with them in the local folklore, for example, that the Abasi can be chased away if you throw a Yakut knife at him with your left hand outward from the bomb. And stuff like that some small subspecies of evil are afraid of cold steel, like the calf eater I wrote about before, but not many of them. With firearms, by the way, the situation is somehow different, usually, if hunters shoot at abysses with their shotguns, they are incapacitated, but usually only for a short time. So, if you encounter an abasi of uncertain origin, don't engage in a one-on-one -on -one battle with it, it's better to just walk away, but not screaming and running, they might chase you, than to box with it in an empty house. 
And while I'm at it, here's a cool story, unrelated to the text I wrote above, it just came to mind. The time of action was in the 70s. There was a Yakut village family with two children. The boy was several years younger than his sister and was growing up very sickly. At the same time, the girl said that these injuries and sores were because of some guests who were invisible to adults, and then things began to happen to her little brother. No one really believed her. After she grew up, the girl told in detail about several particularly memorable cases. The first case. They were both playing near the house in the sandpit, and suddenly the girl noticed that some old woman in white tattered clothes was standing near the barn, looking at her little brother. She was not surprised at first, maybe some acquaintance had come to see her grandmother? But then, when the old woman had been there motionless for several minutes, the girl began to suspect something was wrong. She noticed that the woman had no shadow. The barn next door had a shadow, but she didn't. The frightened girl grabbed her little brother and dragged him into the house, while the old woman remained watching the boy. That same evening, the boy became seriously ill and took a long time to recover. The second incident. A family was having dinner in the house, eating fish. Suddenly the girl noticed that a severed female head with long fluttering hair floated through the air outside the window. Her mouth was moving, as if she were humming something. No sooner had the girl been frightened than her brother choked on a fish bone. It went all the way to the hospital. The third case. Adults were not at home, children played together. Suddenly, glancing out the window, the girl saw a tall stranger standing on the other side of the window, his face very wide and red like a tomato, and looking at her brother steadily. She was frightened, looked at her brother, and he, who had been playing quietly with his toys, suddenly got up, ran over to the big barrel with water, it was winter, in the villages at this time of year they usually filled up the water in big vessels in the house for a few days ahead climbed on the chair which stood near the barrel and, put his head down into the barrel, full of water. Of course, he could not get out on his own, if he had been alone, he would have drowned. The girl was exhausted pulling him out. The boy managed to get the water into his lungs, but the clever girl called the neighbors and they quickly performed CPR on him and took the hapless boy to the hospital. Once again. The boy lived till the end of school, but during another attack of either flu or something else he passed away. The girl lived a long time and she told me about her strange encounters. A group of archaeology students from Yakutsk State University in the 60s went on a summer expedition to one of the remote northern regions of the Republic. They excavated and studied graves in some ancient cemetery. At first it was awkward, then nothing and long periods of boredom, they got used to it. Then one of them suggested that they drive for a day to some alas, where there is a lake where they could swim secretly, away from the eyes of the villagers. The trick was that on the outskirts of this alas was the grave of some local shaman whom the villagers greatly revered. Some students dissuaded their friends from this undertaking, but still it was the Soviet time, atheism and other hollow materialism, in the end about a dozen people, the majority of the group, were willing to go hiking. They came, settled near the lake, played ball, had a swee, and drank. After a certain amount of alcohol, when intoxicated enough, they went to look for that very grave of the shaman, and even found it with no trouble, as it was in plain view, such an ancient grave, and the body was in a closed wooden solitary vault on the surface, this is the way Yakuts used to bury the dead before Christianity, such a structure is called Orangas. Some of the dickheads got excited about the idea of opening up the Orangas and looking at the remains, after all, they were archaeologists, right? The girls, who drank less still talked the guys out of this idea, but they still did a lot of things they shouldn't have done, yelling, littering, etc. Especially the two drunken guys who just took a piss at the base of the Orangas did a great job. With that, they returned to a large communal tent pitched by the lake, where they went to bed. At night they woke up to a real storm brewing outside. They didn't dare go out into this weather and just lay there, listening to the eerie noise of the wind. Suddenly, everyone could clearly hear behind the noise that someone was walking around the tent in circles. At this point, everyone was shitting themselves, because all the members of the expedition were inside the tent, and the alas was many kilometers away from the village. The bravest shouted, Who's there? But got no answer. Suddenly, someone started pounding on the tent from outside with terrible force. The girls began to shout, and then a loud Yakut male voice ordered the two guys who had pissed on the shaman's grave to come out of the tent and call them by name. He called their names, but the frightened friends pushed them out of the tent despite their protests. The guys stood up, looked around, they could not see a fucking thing, it was dark, the wind was raging, all kinds of trash was flying through the air. They stood around for a few minutes, 
got cold, and crawled back into the tent. All their friends and girlfriends were lying in their places, dead, their faces distorted with horror. The boys were a little crazy, screaming and running around in circles. Finally, somehow, they came to their senses, got into the car and drove back to the village, where they reported the incident to the village council. The fate of the two men is unknown. All we know is that there was no storm in the area that night, and the investigation was pretty rough on the guys, but eventually they were released, as it turned out, their friends had all supposedly died of heart attacks. This one happened, according to the legend, at the end of the 19th century, when Yakutia was already part of Russia and was, accordingly, divided into all sorts of districts, Uades, etc. The districts were ruled by rich Yakut princes. Here's one such prince from the central Ullis we're going to talk about. This prince was fucked up even by the standards of those times, he took all the people's goods in his district, built for himself mansions unseen in Yakut villages, sucked all the juice out of the poor, and organized a trial according to his own flawed concepts. However, he regularly collected tribute from the population and sent it to the center, so the authorities were pleased with him and were not going to replace him with another, it's not a democracy. One autumn evening, a wandering poor man, Kumalan, came to the house and asked for dinner and an overnight stay, a common occurrence in those days. As a rule, vagrants paid for this service by doing chores their master would give them. But this vagabond looked so frail and ragged, that the prince, casting a haughty look at him from a distance, ordered to throw him out of the yard, which is not at all Yakutian, usually princes at least give a place in the stable to such poor people. So, they did. The prince noticed that the tramp was hanging around the porch again, and he got angry and ordered to catch him and bring him to him for punishment. The tramp was dragged in, and the prince asked him why he was disobeying him. The wanderer replied in a pitiful voice, I'm hungry, and there's nowhere else to go. If we give you food and shelter, the prince asked mockingly, already contemplating how to make fun of the poor man. Well, he hesitated. I can tell a little of the Olonko. Let me explain, a Nolonko is a kind of a verbal Yakut national epic, a long, tens and hundreds of thousands of lines, song epic tale about the struggle between the forces of good and darkness. The Olonko masters, capable of continuously improvising and captivating their listeners all day long, were highly esteemed in pre-revolutionary Yakutia, where there were no books, television or the internet. Now the Olonko is included in the UNESCO list as a masterpiece, and the local authorities are so proud of it that they mention it in every speech. Really? The prince didn't believe him. Really? You? A master of the Olenko? Well, people seemed to like it. The tramp answered uncertainly. Of course, the prince did not really believe him, but there was nothing to do in the evening anyway, and he decided to give the man a chance. He wanted to listen to the Olonko, and if the poor man was making up nonsense, then he could be punished for it by a public flogging. Yeah, then stay. He said. You tell me the Olonko before you going to sleep until you fall asleep. I'm too irritated if we don't click here or Olonko. That was the end of it. The prince showed his lousy side again and gave the guest the farthest and coldest corner of the house, where they just laid a hard skin on the floor, as a place to sleep. Although the dinner for the prince's family was hearty and there was plenty left over, the tramp was still given only a tiny portion of cottage cheese and a piece of stale bread. He did not express his dissatisfaction in any way. Evening came. The fire was burning in the stove, the prince settled down on his big bed with his wife, they both covered themselves with a blanket and began to listen to the Olonko from the tramp. To the prince's surprise, the man was reading the Olonko very well, and the plot was interesting and unbeatable. He listened to it for about half an hour making occasional cries of approval, but then he had to take a piss. After telling the tramp to stop, he left the house and went to the latrine. The sky was cloudy and it was drizzling with cold rain. As the prince began to go to the bathroom in the dark, something suddenly grabbed him by the shoulders and pulled him off the ground. He looked up, holy fuck. A huge black vulture clutched his shoulders and carried him somewhere in the sky. The prince began to kick, but then realized that if the bird let him go, he would crash and froze in a frenzy. They flew for a long time, the cold air had time to almost cover the prince's skin with frost, and then the vulture threw the prince down into some wasteland, where a huge bonfire was burning and naked women were dancing nearby. When the prince rose, one of the women came up to him and began to stick the nipple of her lush breasts into his mouth. He tried to turn away, but he seemed paralyzed and the milk poured into his mouth, only it turned out to be blood, not milk. 
The prince began to swallow the blood so as not to drown himself. When the woman had finished, she laughed and said to him. Now you have tasted human blood and separated from the light, you have become one of us. The prince looked at himself and was fucked, his body had been transformed, covered with pustules and tubercles and generally began to look like a dead man. The woman said to him. There, now you've found your true self. Not for nothing, not for nothing did I send my faithful messenger to you in the guise of a wandering singer to tear out your soul and send it to us in the lower world. Now you can throw away human conventions and do true evil. Oh! The prince timidly inquired. We will send you back to the middle world. I.e. earth. And you can do whatever bad things you want there. With these words the woman snapped her fingers, and some half-human half-beasts appeared and grabbed the prince from all sides. They skinned him, the poor guy was in a lot of fucking pain, broke his neck and turned his head 180 degrees, cut off his nose and lips and ears and scalped him. Then the vulture carried him, squirming, up somewhere again and dropped him in a deserted clearing. The prince realized that he was in one of the alas near his village. But the light hurt him, and at the sight of people he began to panic, and he could not return to the village and show his face to people. He huddled for months in frozen, abandoned houses and became increasingly embittered at the world. When people came to one of his empty dwellings to spend the night, he would sneak up on them at night, strangle them, and then devour their flesh. But this only made his hunger more excruciating. Finally, one day a shaman came to the clearing and began performing a ritual to exorcise the unclean force. The prince felt as if he were burning alive, and suddenly he saw that his body was indeed enveloped by tongues of flame coming from within. He screamed in horror, realizing that this was the end, screamed and, and woke up on his bed, it turned out that he had dozed off while listening to the Olanko. His wife was already asleep, the fire in the stove was almost out, and the wandering Olanko master was looking at him with a half-smile. Well, did you like my Olanko? He asked. Is it enough for you? Or should I go on? Waking up from his stupor, the prince immediately ordered to light the stove again, ordered to prepare a big dinner and move his guest to the best bedroom, and began to almost kick his ass. The family looked at the prince with amazement, what had gotten into him? The tramp spent the night like a king, and in the morning, the prince gave him one of his best horses and gave him a considerable sum of money. Warmly bidding him farewell, the tramp rode out of the courtyard and left the village. It was not until later that the prince learned that a great shaman had recently passed through his neighborhood somewhere to the north on his own business. Another archetypical spook from Yakutia is usually associated not with evil forces, but with quite neutral and even benevolent spirits of nature, which sometimes, under special circumstances, a person can behold. However, for an unprepared person, such an encounter can still be quite eerie. A young girl was spending her summer in a Yakut village. Since June, there have been white nights in central Yakutia, and falling asleep in the summer is sometimes a problem, especially when the weather is humid. One night the girl couldn't sleep at all. She had been tossing and turning in her bed for hours, trying every way to fall asleep, reading a book, counting sheep, turning over a pillow, but to no avail. When it was well past midnight, she gave up and decided to go outside to get some air. The house where the girl lived was on the outskirts of the village. Beyond that was only a field, and beyond it, a forest. And so, standing on the porch, she heard the sound of some big choir coming from the field, as if people had gathered and were singing. The girl became interested and looked out of the gate. Indeed, there were people in the field, dancing Asu o Kai, so called the National Yakut Dance, reminiscent of a round dance with a chant. All those gathered were dressed very fine. The chant was clearly audible, but the girl, no matter how hard she listened, could not make out a word. Intrigued, she stepped outside the fence and headed into the field. She did not feel any anxiety or fear, it was a warm white night, it was bright as day and there was a whole crowd of people celebrating something, what was there to be afraid of? However, after traveling about a third of the field, the girl began to notice something wrong. At the gate, she saw that the Asuhai was being conducted in the center of the field, but as she walked, people somehow moved further away, being closer to the edge of the forest, although it seems that they did not move on purpose. The chant did not grow louder, despite the close proximity. Words were still hard to make out, but choir began to break up into separate voices that sounded in a special way unstructured, as if everyone was singing his own special tune without paying attention to others. However, the determined girl kept walking forward, not thinking much about these oddities. The longer she walked, 
The farther away from her was the Asuokai. Now the dance was carried out literally on the border of the field and the forest. Although the field was bright, the girl could not distinguish the faces of the dancers, she could only see their brightly colored clothes. In the end, after walking more than half of the field, she suddenly realized that there was no more Wasuai, people had somehow imperceptibly disappeared into the forest, but the sounds of their incoherent chanting still continued to be heard from behind the trees. It was then that the girl was startled to realize that she was standing all alone in the field at night. She turned around and ran back. By the time she reached her house, the chant had stopped, and the field was empty again. In the morning, the girl told her family about her nightly encounter. The story did not make a special impression on her relatives, they only noticed that if she saw the dance of the spirits of nature, it was for good and good luck. They scolded the night traveler for the fact that she could not understand for a long time that she could not see real people, they said, you would also go into the woods in the middle of the night in search of a deer. This story happened to a friend of mine, whose name is Senya. Last August he and his friends decided to go on a nature trip. They took beer, a barbecue and swimming trunks with them. The place they were going to was near the village of Tulagino. A small village is situated across the river, a little farther away there are abandoned houses and cowsheds, and behind them fields, and these fields are infamous among the locals. In high spirits, friends arrived at one of the fields, they settled down, played music loudly in the car, laughed made a fire and shashlik. Towards the night, with only the dim light of the moon illuminating the wide field, Senya decided to go away to relieve himself. There, standing in the field, was a yakut hitching post, and Senya decided to mark it, which, by the way, is considered a grave insult to the local spirits according to yakut belief. Standing, doing his job, enjoying the silence. Suddenly a strange feeling of uneasiness overtook him, as if someone was watching him. After a minute or so, he heard the sound of a tambourine in the distance, in Yakutia, tambourines were used by ancient shamans during their comlands, shamanic sessions. The sound was quiet at first, but with time it was getting closer and growing louder. My friend was anxious, but at the same time he was torn with curiosity and stood listening. The sound of the tambourine was getting closer, it seemed as if it was being played just over the hill, 50 or so paces away from Senya. Senya was trying to see in the darkness the source of the sound, and suddenly an animalistic instinctual fear took over him, it seemed to him that someone was standing right behind him and breathing on the back of his head. He got the fuck out of there, running as fast as he could towards the car. When he returned to his friends, he told them what he had heard. Everyone listened, indeed, the heavy sounds of a tambourine were spreading throughout the surroundings as if coming from all directions at once. The frightened friends got into the car and drove back. Senya never returned to those fields again. It happened to me 12 years ago, when I was a child. Every month my cousin Borea came to visit me. He was older than me and liked to scare me, he wore masks, robes, even took my mother's fur coat to pretend he was a monster. My heart would go in my heels, and he was still laughing. One day, as usual, his parents came to our dacha. In the evening everyone gathered around the table, and they sent us outside to play. August nights in Yakutia are dark, and my brother and I played in the yard, lit by the bright moon. We played hide and seek, that time it was me who was the seeker. My brother hid well. I was looking for him for a long time, and suddenly I heard a strange sound in the current bushes, as if someone sighed heavily and sadly. I immediately realized that it was Borea, as always, trying to scare me, and shouted, Boris come out, I know you're there. Boris really responded, but behind me, in a completely different place. Intrigued, I took the stick, went over to the bush and poked it lightly with the stick. From behind the bush, in the moonlight, an oval wrinkled face of a white yellow hue peeked out. It looked hideous, its eye sockets empty, its mouth wet and without teeth, its lips cracked like an old man's. I was horrified. It was so wild and creepy that even after 12 years the thought of that creature still gives me the creeps. When I came to my senses, I ran home as fast as I could, sobbing. It took me a long time to recover from what had happened. My parents thought it was my brother's work and scolded Borea. But I knew for sure it wasn't him. That night, when everyone was asleep, I tossed and turned on my bed unable to sleep for a long time. Lying in my room, which was on the second floor, I heard under the window the heavy sighs of the creature. This happened to my uncle from Yakutia. 
He lives in the countryside and works as a teacher. One fall, he and a friend decided to go duck hunting. They chose a distant place, about 50 kilometers from the village. Having submitted his teaching hours, he walked to the arranged lake in the afternoon. The autumn sky was quickly darkening and getting colder. The friend still hadn't arrived, as it turned out later, he had been urgently called away for work in the neighboring village, and had to leave without warning my uncle. In the excitement of the hunt, uncle did not notice that it was already evening, and a light drizzle began to fall. Uncle decided to go to an old, abandoned hut on the edge of a forest to take cover. He decided to spend the night there as well and go back in the morning. He kindled a fire in the stove, ate, then got into his sleeping bag and began to get ready for sleep, when suddenly, out of the blue, uneasiness began to creep into his consciousness. Lying in the sack, my uncle did not notice when he fell asleep. He woke up because drops of water were falling on his face and his sleeping bag was damp. Opening his eyes, uncle saw that he was not lying inside the hut, but outside in the rain. He ran inside the hut, very cold. Thinking that some abbas was playing a trick on him, he drank half a bottle of vodka at once for courage and went to bed, having first propped the flimsy door of the hut with a lock. And again, he fell into the arms of Morpheus. He woke up yet again, soaked through with rain, in the street. He swore and went stubbornly inside the building, relighted the fire in the stove, drank the rest of the vodka, took out his knife, and got into the wet sleeping bag. Deciding to wait for the trickster, pretending to be asleep. An hour goes by, from a dark corner, in the glow of smoldering embers, emerged the an almost two meter tall figure of a woman dressed in old Yakut clothes. Her hair was loose, her facial features were invisible, but in the light of the embers he could see her in human eyes, which were yellow in color. The uncle lay with his eyes half closed, neither dead nor alive. The woman came to him, took hold of his sleeping bag, and began to drag him outside. My uncle lay there pretending to be asleep. When the devil had disappeared, he grabbed all his things and retreated home, despite the hail in the darkness. A few years later, my uncle visited that lake again and looked into the hut. There were gunshot marks on the walls on the inside. Apparently, some hunter was attacked by this evil thing, and the hunter decided not to be ceremonious. Returning to the subject of Yakut shamans. As you know, in Yakut religion the mystical power of shamans is associated with numerous external elements. I have already spoken about the parent beast and the sacred place of dismemberment. Besides this, there is also the rather murky concept of Voyan Maha, shaman tree, that is, an ordinary tree that is somehow associated with the shaman. I cannot say unequivocally what it is, because each source pushes its own version. Whether it's a tree where the shaman encapsulates some of his power, so that if anything he can restore energy from it, as a backup. Or whether it is just a tree where the parent beast nests, in case it is a bird. Or whether it is some kind of special achievement, which is unique to predatory shamans, and white shamans look at it as a bullshit. Anyways, I don't know, all we know is that the shaman tree is usually not some special tree, that is, it does not reach a huge size, is not covered with a black crust, and is located far away in the wilds not standing out in the forest. It felt like the shamans were trying to hide their tree as best they could and make it inconspicuous, not to show it off to anyone. Such a purely utilitarian artifact. And it is believed that shaman tree retain mystical properties even after the death of the shaman. By the way, the shaman tree should not be confused with the karya I described in previous pasts. Karyak is just a revere tree through which travelers express their respect to local spirits, i.e. it has nothing to do with shamans. It was in Soviet times, somewhere in the 70s. It was autumn and a family went out to the woods to pick lingot slash cowberries. Since the nearby places were all already developed by the villagers, our heroes decided to go deeper into the woods in the hope of stumbling upon a fertile place. They arrived in their gaze upon some fucking dirt road, got out and began to spread out. The head of the family, Alexei, also went looking for berries with a bucket. People shouted from time to time, as to not to get lost. They soon understood from the shouts that the place sucked as far as berries were concerned, and had to go and look for more somewhere else. Already about to go back to the car, Alexei decided to take a few more steps into the forest. He walked literally a dozen meters and sprung with joy, under his feet, the ground was simply red with berries, and not just simple, but large, almost as big as plums. Alexei sat down, ran the bucket with the claws a couple of times under the berry bushes, and the bucket immediately became half full. Having shouted to his own to come to him as soon as possible, he began to collect berries with enthusiasm. The bucket was filled to the brim in about five minutes. 
satisfied, he sat down to smoke, once again shouting something like. He sits, smokes, rejoices over his luck, and suddenly sees that a large tree grows nearby, in the heart of a fertile area. Well, the tree is a tree as big, old and branchy. Alexei was interested in that there was a hollow on a tree, and the head of some bird looked out from there. Alexei looks and looks, and the bird does not move. He stood up and looked more closely, and it turned out that it was not a real bird, but a handmade wooden tool in the shape of a bird. Alexei wondered where in a dense forest such a thing came from. Yeah, it. He thought, and then realized that he wanted to piss. He didn't want to spoil the berries, so he peed on the same large tree. Then he squatted down and kept waiting for his friends. He waited and waited, no one came. He cried out again. Ma'ash. Calling for his wife. This time he was answered, and the voice was very close, but he could not understand what his wife was saying. What? Alexei asked. The wife said something again, literally from behind the nearest trees, but again unintelligible, and there was no sign of her. Alexei called out to his son. Valera. No sooner was he silenced than right over his ear his son's voice muttered. I'm here, turn around. Alexei turned around, no one, only the wooden bird seemed to change position and now looking directly at him. That's where our hero shat himself. Forgetting about the bucket and the berries, he rushed back in the direction of the car. He wandered for a long time through the woods, almost lost his way, but at last he heard his family members shouting and came out to them. He asked them why the fuck they didn't answer his call. His wife, son and daughter said that they did not hear any shouts, that he just stopped answering at some point and that they got worried and started looking for him. Alexei was ashamed of his panic and didn't tell them about the damn thing, he just said that he had found a very fertile place. Everyone became interested and went in search of that fabulous place. They walked back and forth for an hour, but they didn't find a fucking thing. He lost the bucket filled with berries, but what can you do, they decided to go to another place. Shortly after this incident, Alexei has developed a rash. Red covering his whole body from face to heels, causing excruciating itching. He went to hospitals, doctors, and healers, all to no avail. By wind of the rash was joined by a general weakness, Alexei could hardly get out of bed on his own. At last, on the advice of his friends, he called to him, a man from a nearby village, who had a reputation as a kind of a shaman. The man arrived, examined him, and said literally the following. You broke the line somewhere, you went to a place you shouldn't have been, you did something you shouldn't have done. He began to question him about what had happened to him over the past year. It was here that Alexei remembered the strange incident in the woods. The acting shaman was very interested in the incident and suggested that Alexei had stumbled upon a shaman tree and insulted it, maybe by immediately grabbing all the goods that grew under it, maybe by pissing on it, or maybe just by the tree itself being evil by default. Either way, he said. You need to go to that place and find the tree and apologize to it, offering gifts. Except that Alexei should look for that shaman tree alone, if he went there in company, he would never find it. And so, in the cold of January, the ailing Alexei tried to travel several times a week to a remote place and wander there in the middle of the winter woods. The trouble was that he could not remember the exact spot, and the fact that the shaman tree could even go to the astral plane and become invisible, too, did not make him very optimistic. But Alexei did not give up trying until the spring, went through the forest by the road length and breadth. And in spring he died of his strange illness and did not find that mysterious place. The shaman tree did not appear to him a second time. It did not forgive him. In the 17th century, there was a shaman in Yakutia, I've forgotten his name, and not a simple one, but a great one. According to the evidence of contemporaries and even later shamans, practically the greatest in the entire history of Yakutia. He did many epic deeds in his life, he did good, he did evil, in general, he left a big mark in the memory of the people. But in his old age he said that the time has come for him to die, or rather, to return to the source, to fly into his astral, Diabinakitor. And his will was. I feel that centuries from now there will come a time of great trials and accomplishments. And by that time, I will be ready to return to the middle world even more powerful. You will know that the time has come, somehow, but you will know. And then let one brave woman come to my grave and ride it at midnight. A big black spider will crawl out from under the grave. She will have to take it with her and throw it into the bowl of milk and drink it all. Then this woman would be pregnant with my new incarnation, and I shall yield again, and lead the Akut clan to the greatest heights. With these words the shaman died. 
A proper grave was built for him, buried and, naturally, soon forgotten. At the end of the 19th century a rumor ran through the village where there was a dilapidated shamanic grave, supposedly at night people began to hear the heavy beats of the shaman's tambourine and see muddy wandering lights. The old man is shamanizing, calling to himself, the time has come for him to be reborn. People whispered. They remembered the legend of the will, chatted about it, and didn't do a fucking thing. Whether for the past 300 years brave women in the Akut villages have degenerated, or whether shamanic precepts are no longer taken so seriously, but there was not a single chick who would have gone to the grave at night and started eating a spider. For a long decade, right up to the turn of the 20th century, the shaman's grave remained restless, he kept calling for even the lowest horror. He didn't stick around though, it eventually just stopped. That's the epic fiasco of all the Yakut people and the shaman personally. I remember a story from my childhood. It was told to me by three people who directly participated in the event, my two uncles and their mutual friend. I remember it very badly, and when I try to ask the storytellers again, they say, yes, there was something like that, but better forget it. So, if there are any inconsistencies in the narrative, don't blame them. I will still try to take a crack at it, and if anything, I will correct my narrative. Anyway, here it goes. When this trio were still kids, they and a few others liked to get together and go somewhere far away like camping. And one day on one of such expeditions. They wandered into some woods. They were running there, having fun. They looked, there was an abandoned house. They approached it, looked around. It stands on a glade, old, dilapidated, door on one hinge, no glass in the windows, a typical small wooden house. There was no fence, fence of any kind, or anything enclosing the plot. The house itself was also strange, there was only a table and a bench inside. No stove, no shelf, at least, an empty house. In corners, there were some feathers, small bones, in general it was clear that the house was uninhabited and there was no one in it for a long time. Well, the children frolic, playing hide and seek, and close to the evening they go away. Eventually they forget about the house and a couple of months later they suddenly remembered and decided to go there again. They went there, inside the house and went nuts. There was a cow's skull nailed to the doorway. There were symbols all over the place, someone had carved them into the walls, floor, and ceiling. A lot of bird remains were laying on the floor, some of them quite fresh and some twigs and leaves lying around. A piece of meat was on the table, probably prepared for food, with an open notebook. There were many symbols, apparently repeating what was written inside the house, and a single legible inscription that read, If you want to become one of us, kill one of the seven. This in itself already made the children feel afraid. And then the children who had stayed outside came running in and said that they had found some kind of a fireplace outside, with smoldering embers in it. Whoever the mysterious inhabitant of the house was, he had been here recently, or maybe he was still here. So, of course the kids ran out of there. One of the storytellers told me that as they were running away, he turned around and looked at the bushes growing almost at the edge of the clearing, and under them he saw someone's feet, painfully small, as if some child was standing behind the bushes and then those feet quickly ran somewhere deep into the forest. Anyways, the kids came running and scattered to their homes and didn't tell anyone about it. A couple of days later a girl who was with them at the time was driven over by a car. It was only after the funeral and everything else that the kids realized there were seven of them. So that was it. <laughs>